So the topic of this video today is really going to be an overview of photosynthesis. This diagram here kind of uh, illustrates the things that we are going to be discussing. So let's go ahead and get started. So the sun gives off a wide variety of types of energy and the energy travels across space in the form of a wave and you can see the different kinds of energy radio microwave infrared and so on now this presentation we're going to focus our attention on the visible light that is released from the sun uh, because those are the wavelengths that actually power photosynthesis so when we focus on the light given off by the sun the visible light visible light is also known as white light now you might know that white light is actually a mixture of something called Roy G. Biv, which is the colors of the rainbow, the spectrum here, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. So white light is actually a mixture of all these colors together. Well, how do we know this? Well, if you shine a white light source into a prism, a rainbow comes out the other side. Just like you see in this animation, white light is entering from the left and because of the curvature of the prism, the wavelengths of the other colors of light begin to separate. Notice the red wavelength is longer and the violet wavelengths are more narrow. And in this picture right here, you can actually see white light coming in and on the left hand side, a rainbow coming out. So this is how we know that uh, white light is a mixture of all these colors. You know, you can actually see a similar effect. Water in the air can act like a prism and separate the colors of white light into a rainbow. After it rains, it's very common to see rainbows. And in this picture near a waterfall, all the water and all the mist that's in the air is separating the sunlight and you can actually see a rainbow. So colors of light are either reflected or absorbed by objects. You know, in this example, when we shine light onto a leaf, we see reflected light. And in this example, green light is reflecting off of the leaves, but the other colors are absorbing into the leaves. Well, why do bananas appear yellow? So the reason these bananas appear yellow is because when light is shined on them, yellow light is reflected the wavelength of yellow is reflected the other colors are absorbed so in this example when light is shined on these balloons the reason the balloons appear blue is because they're reflecting the blue wavelength the other colors are absorbed so white is an interesting color so white objects they appear white because they reflect all the wavelengths and all the wavelengths enter our eyes and our brain interprets this as the color white so the opposite effect are objects that are colored black when light shines on a black object no light reflects into our eyes and and we and the black object absorbs the colors and we don't see any light at all and, and that's what we interpret as the color black okay so when we relate this to photosynthesis you know most plants have green leaves which means when sunlight shines on them the reason they appear green is because they're reflecting green light it's the other colors the red the orange the yellow the blue the indigo violet that are absorbing the other colors are absorbing into the leaves and it's really the other uh, the other colors that are really going to drive and power photosynthesis so here's a really interesting graph and what this graph is showing at the bottom of the graph the wavelengths of visible light and the numbers correspond to various colors and when you look at the line graph notice there's a peak around 400 nanometers well that's the wavelength for blue light and notice there's another peak around 700 nanometers that's the wavelength for red light so what this graph is showing me is the rate of photosynthesis is highest in red light and uh, in blue light so red and blue are the colors of light that are most stimulating in terms of a plant's ability to do photosynthesis Notice there's a dip or a valley in the middle of the graph around 550 nanometers. Ironically, that's the wavelength for green. So the color that we most uh, 
uh, relate to plants, you know, green leaves. The color that we most think of when in, in terms of plants, green is actually the least powerful to them in photosynthesis because leaves are green. Most green sunlight is reflected. Very little green light ever actually absorbs for them to do for, for them to do photosynthesis with the green light. So when we look at a general definition of photosynthesis, you know, it's the process that converts solar energy into glucose. And this formula here outlines photosynthesis. And in the reactants, we have carbon dioxide and water. And in the presence of sunlight, we'll produce sugars such as glucose and oxygen. Well, who? Who performs photosynthesis? Well, these are the autotrophs. Now, we typically think of plants as doing photosynthesis, but they're not the only ones. Algae, phytoplankton, the basis of ocean food webs, kelp. Kelp can grow into these enormous underwater forests. And even some bacteria known as cyanobacteria are photosynthetic. So there's a lot more autotrophs than just plants. So photosynthesis is also what we call an endergonic chemical reaction. And what that means is that photosynthesis requires the input of energy. From the picture, I'm implying that sunlight. Sunlight is the energy that is input to power photosynthesis. And when we talk about the end result, what's created? Well, oxygen, which is a waste gas, and simple sugars like glucose. But when we zoom on into the leaf, we find some peculiar pores on their underside. These pores will open and close, and they're called stomata, and it's how they exchange gases. It's how they take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And when they produce oxygen as a waste through these stomata openings, they give off the oxygen created. So it's through these pores that they exchange gas with the atmosphere. Okay, so let's actually get into the process of photosynthesis. You know, as an overview, you're probably going to see a diagram very similar to this. Well, we're going to be able to break photosynthesis down into two separate reactions. If this is a chloroplast, inside of the chloroplast, there are internal parts. And on the left side of my diagram are the parts involved in the light dependent reactions of photosynthesis. Like the name implies, sunlight is, is needed. Sunlight, it, this is dependent upon sunlight. And then on the right hand side of the chloroplast, this is, would be the light independent reactions, also known as the Calvin cycle. So throughout the rest of these notes, we're going to make sense out of this summary diagram that you see right here. So let's first start talking about the light dependent reactions. Well, if we identify parts of a chloroplast, the liquidy interior is known as the stroma, much like the cytoplasm of a cell, there's a liquidy interior. And then there are these structures, these little disks that are stacked on top of each other called a thylakoid. So there's a thylakoid disk, there's a thylakoid disk, there's one, there's one, there's one. And the entire stack of thylakoids is what's called a granum. So if you ever come across the word the words thylakoids and granum, well, I hope this gives you a better understanding of what they are. They are parts inside of a chloroplast. So when we focus on the light dependent reactions, first of all, the location is going to be the membrane of a thylakoid. And that's because the membranes are loaded with chlorophyll molecules. Perhaps you've heard of chlorophyll from middle school. Chlorophyll is the molecule that actually absorbs sunlight. So with the addition of sunlight and H2O water and various enzymes, now the enzymes I didn't picture in my animation, but this is going to start a chemical reaction known as the light dependent reactions. And in the process, some oxygen waste is created. It's kind of fun because the O's for the oxygen, the oxygen atoms actually come from water. The water molecule gets broken down and the oxygens are released as waste. And then a molecule that uh, abbreviated NADPH is created and notice in the animation, it's released into the stroma. NADPH is a pretty big molecule here. Molecule here. You can see its name, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate, 21 carbons, 29 hydrogens, and so on. Um, the formula of NADPH, I, I'm, I'm not going to test you on that, but the importance of NAD, NADPH 
is that it's a hydrogen carrier. It's carrying a lot of hydrogens, and those hydrogens are going to go into the stroma where we're going to have, uh, where they're going to be used in the second part, the second reaction of photosynthesis. Also, molecules of ATP are produced. And so you have really three things that are created, oxygen waste, NADPH, and ATP. Well, now let's focus on the light independent reactions, also known as the Kelvin cycle. And so the location of the Kelvin cycle, the location of the light independent reactions is the liquidy interior of the chloroplast, the stroma. And we now have the input of carbon dioxide. You've probably known for a while that plants and other autotrophs absorb and take in carbon dioxide. And here's where they need it. They take in carbon dioxide plus the ATP from the light dependent reactions plus the NADPH from the light dependent reactions. And this starts what is known as the Calvin cycle, a series of chemical reactions in order to create glucose, C6H12O6. In the Calvin cycle, this is where the glucose is created. But to keep photosynthesis going, the H, the hydrogens from NADPH are used and the NADP goes back into the light, uh, uh, light dependent reactions. And then the ATP, when the ATP is broken down, the ADP, the ADP also returns to the light dependent reaction. So there's a lot of moving parts here. But when you look at the diagram I just showed you, I hope it makes a lot more sense now. So now that we've kind of walked through the summary here, I hope this diagram from a few minutes ago makes a little more sense. On the left, again, is the light-dependent reactions. And if we just kind of read through it, the light-dependent reactions were, is where sunlight and water create oxygen waste, NADPH, and ATP. And then we move to the right-hand side, the light-independent reactions, also known as the Calvin cycle. This is where ATP, NADPH, and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere are used to create glucose. The glucose is then released into the cytoplasm of the cell, and the glucose, you'll see what its purpose will be for in a moment. Okay, so what do plants and autotrophs use their glucose for? Well, here's a bad little clip art drawing here of a cell. Here's the nucleus, the central vacuole, the green parts are the chloroplast, the orange parts are the mitochondria. Well, a chloroplast will perform photosynthesis and create glucose, but notice where the glucose goes. It goes into a mitochondria. The mitochondria will then perform cellular respiration and release a whole heap, a whole bunch of ATP that the cell can use for its energy needs. And so really plants make glucose in order to then do cellular respiration to make ATP. So that makes cellular respiration and ATP really important. And we'll learn about that in another lesson. So one of your tasks is you should be able to fill in this blank diagram here, pause the video and try to go through this. And of course you can check your answers based on the diagram from a few moments ago. And so there you go. There's a, a, a little summary of photosynthesis and the light dependent and light independent reactions. Hope you found this helpful. If you're in my class, you know, try these questions. I'm happy to check your answers before school or after school one day. Thanks for watching.